Last video, we saw how to find the ideal road for a square wheel to roll on. If you haven't seen the previous episode, I recommend watching it first, as this video is going to build on that one. I'll leave a link to it in the description. But to review, the task was to start with a wheel that could be any simple closed curve, and figure out what shape the road needs to be so that a chosen axle point within the wheel stays confined to a horizontal line as the wheel rolls. The trick to getting a handle on this problem was to make two observations about rolling. One, that the axle and road wheel contact point always lie on a vertical line if the axle moves only horizontally. And two, the rim of the wheel is stationary relative to the road at the exact point where it contacts the road. These two observations gave rise to our two road wheel equations, which we use to determine that a square wheel rolls smoothly over a road made up of a chain of upside-down catenary curves. In this video, we'll look at finding the ideal roads for some other wheel shapes, such as other polygons and ellipses. Then we'll see if we can take what we learned from the last video to solve the inverse problem, starting with a road and finding the ideal wheel to roll on it. But unlike the last video, we won't spend so much time going through the nitty-gritty details of the computations, and instead focus more on the interesting road wheel pairs that are out there and some of their more interesting characteristics. But we'll hopefully go into enough detail so that you'll end up with a pretty solid understanding of how it all works once we're done. Okay, all set? Then let's roll. Last video, we looked at a square wheel, and found that the road it rolls smoothly over is a chain of upside-down catenary curves, where each catenary arch in the chain comes from one of the straight-line sides of the square. The basic idea was a catenary is the ideal curve for a line to roll on. So gluing four catenaries together at the right points will give you the road for a wheel consisting of four line segments glued together. As you might expect, this principle applies to any wheel containing straight line segments. The shape of the road will need to be a piece of a catenary whenever the wheel starts rolling on one of its linear edges. So it means that the ideal shape of road for any polygonal wheel, whether it be a triangle, square, hexagon, or something else, will just be another chain of upside-down catenaries, though the locations of the cutoffs between adjacent catenary components will be different depending on the particular polygon to ensure the polygon's vertices fit snugly into each cusp. Maybe this isn't a very exciting discovery, and I guess it's not, but there is a small twist to the story. It turns out something a little odd happens for the simplest of the regular polygons, a triangle. Like all polygons, its ideal road is a chain of upside-down catenaries, but unlike the other regular polygons, you can't actually get a triangle to roll on this road quite so perfectly in the real world. That's because the cusps between the catenaries on this road are so deep, and its sides so steep, that the tip of the triangle actually crashes into the road before it can wedge itself completely into the cusp. Luckily, this isn't a problem for the other regular polygons, and people have actually built the road for a square wheel. So the main takeaway here is that it's possible to find a road wheel couple that is impossible to physically implement despite being mathematically ideal. But enough with polygons, let's move on to something else, like an ellipse. It turns out the ideal road for an ellipse is a wavy road, which dips down whenever the long side of the ellipse rotates below the axle. At first glance, it kind of looks like a sine wave, but is it actually a sine wave? You gotta admit, it'd be pretty poetic if it is, because ellipses are just deformed circles, and if you trace the up and down movement of a point that's traveling around a circle, you generate a sine wave. Alas, it turns out this road is not a sine wave, which you can see if I overlay an actual sine wave with the same amplitude and period as the road curve. They line up pretty well, but if I zoom in, you can see they don't coincide perfectly. Dang, what a shame. Okay, well if it's not a sine wave, then what kind of curve is it? Well, it's complicated. If you chug through the algebra of the road wheel equations, you ultimately end up with a rather ugly integral expression for the road's x function. It turns out this integral is a type of integral called an elliptic integral, 
I guess that's kind of fitting, since we're dealing with an ellipse here. But if you know anything about elliptic integrals, you know they only ever mean suffering and despair. Meaning, there's no nice closed-form solution to this integral. You can only approximate it numerically. What a letdown! It was sure looking like an ellipse would give rise to a nice, sweet, sinusoidal road. But instead, we got some stupid, weird waveform whose formula we can't even write! <sighs> well, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Unless... Take a look at our elliptical wheel again. Notice how its axle is placed at the center of the wheel. That's what we've had in all the wheels we've looked at so far, but it's not required by any means. We can place the axle wherever we like in the wheel, and the shape of the resulting road will change. But where else should we put it? Well, a pretty natural pick would be one of the ellipse's foci. If you haven't heard of them before, the foci, or focuses, of an ellipse are two special points inside it that are shockingly important in dealing with them. Foci come up over and over again when ellipses appear, and seem to play an almost magical role in their geometry. For example, if you take a piece of loose string, anchor it at two points, and then hook a pencil on it and start drawing while keeping the string taut, you'll trace out an ellipse, and the two anchor points will become the foci of that ellipse. In fact, this is one of the classic definitions of an ellipse. Foci also show up in the motion of the planets. Kepler's first law says, at least to a first approximation, that the planets orbit the Sun in an ellipse, where the Sun is at one of the foci. It's seriously kind of crazy just how often the foci turn out to be critical in analyzing a problem involving ellipses. If an ellipse is involved in your problem, you can bet that framing your problem around the foci will lead you somewhere interesting. With that in mind, let's see what happens to the road if we move the axle to a focus of our elliptical wheel. Well, at first glance, it doesn't look like anything changed all that much. I mean, the peaks and valleys got more pronounced since the offset axle has made the min and max radius of the wheel get further apart, but overall it still looks like the same kind of wavy road we saw before. But it's not. With the axle placed out of focus, the road is now a genuine sine wave. In fact, for this ellipse, with height square root of 2 and width 1, the road is described perfectly by a sine wave of amplitude 1 half and wavelength pi. So we got our sine wave after all! And isn't it even more poetic now, since it came about from placing the axle at a focus? Which is where, so often, the magic of an ellipse manifests. It turns out more generally that the placement of a wheel's axle often has a pretty dramatic effect on the shape of its ideal road. For example, take a circular wheel with its axle at its center, and watch what happens to the road as I gradually move the axle toward the rim. The bottom of the road sinks, and its edges become sharper and steeper, and once the axle finally gets to the rim, the road has become a semicircle. And not just a semicircle-like curve, but an actual semicircle, whose radius happens to be exactly twice that of the wheel. Isn't that neat? If you move the axle of a circular wheel to its rim, its ideal road becomes another circle. So we've gotten some interesting roads from playing around with various wheels and axle locations. But what if we want to start with a particular road and find the perfect wheel to roll on it? The inverse problem, that is. Let's tackle that now. The main tool we've been using to find roads from wheels is the road wheel equations, which we derived in full last video. They gave us a way to start with a polar parametric description of the wheel, r and theta, and solve for the corresponding road parametric functions, x and y. So to do the reverse, to find the ideal wheel for a given road, we need to reverse this process. We need a way to compute the r and theta wheel functions given the x and y road functions. It turns out this is actually pretty simple to do, although there will be some complications later on. It's basically just a matter of rearranging the original road wheel equations so they're solved for r and theta instead of x and y. Solving for r is easy. Just negate both sides of the first road wheel equation, and we get negative y equals r, or flipping it around, r equals negative y. As for theta, if we divide both sides of the second road wheel equation by r, 
we get that the derivative of theta is 1 over r times the derivative of x. But we can use our newly rearranged first equation to swap out r for negative y, and so we get the derivative of theta is equal to negative 1 over y times the derivative of x. And that's kind of it. You can get the r function almost for free by negating whatever the Rhodes y function is, and you can get the theta function by integrating negative 1 over y times the derivative of x, similar to how we previously would get the x function by integrating r times the derivative of theta. So the whole process of finding a wheel from a road looks and feels very similar to doing it the other way around. Pretty cool. Just to sanity check ourselves, I'll get the computer to solve these equations for a sine wave road. We already know that the corresponding wheel should be an ellipse with its axle at a focus. And... Wait, what? This is not an ellipse. It doesn't even look like a wheel. The rim kind of goes back on itself, like a contorted paperclip or something. Did I mess up? Does it even roll? Okay, it does roll, so I guess it technically works, but it's really weird and doesn't look much like what we would ordinarily call a wheel, much less an ellipse, which is what we were expecting. What's going on here? To start, let's get a clearer idea of what makes a normal wheel normal before we try to explain the weird wheel we got. The thing in common with all the normal looking wheels we've encountered is that they've all been simple closed shapes. That is, a shape whose boundary is a closed curve that doesn't intersect itself anywhere. One of the consequences of this is the wheel curve will be periodic, meaning that as the wheel rolls, the road wheel contact point on the wheel travels all the way around the curve and returns to its starting point after a finite amount of time and then repeats the trip after that. This property is transferred to the road the wheel rolls on. A periodic wheel must roll on a periodic road, that is, a road that repeats itself regularly. So turning this around, we know that to get a normal looking wheel from a road, we have to at least require the road itself to be periodic. If the road is not periodic, then neither will the wheel be, which means the wheel won't be a closed curve. But, you might point out, the road we started with is periodic. It's a sine wave, after all. So what's the deal? Why isn't the wheel we got periodic too? Actually, in a certain sense, the wheel we got is periodic. If I draw a plot of the wheel radius versus the angle of rotation, you can see that the wheel's radius does repeat itself as you rotate the wheel. So the radius is periodic as a function of the rotation angle. The problem is, this period does not correspond to a complete rotation of the wheel. Although the radius of the wheel does return to its starting value, it does so without rotating a full 360 degrees. The radius repeats itself before the angle does. They're out of sync with each other. So to get a closed curve wheel, its radius must complete a cycle precisely after the wheel rotates a full 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians. Or if not, then at least it has to repeat after some integer fraction of 2 pi, so you can get a full 2 pi rotation by stringing multiple radius cycles together. This can be stated mathematically by saying the difference between the theta values of the wheel before and after a road period must equal 2 pi or an integer fraction of 2 pi. By rewriting the left-hand side as an integral of the derivative of theta, we can relate it to the road functions x and y. To get a closed wheel, we need the integral of negative 1 over y times the derivative of x over a period to equal 2 pi or an integer fraction of 2 pi. But hang on, this still doesn't fully explain why we didn't get an elliptical wheel from this sine wave. I mean, when we started with an elliptical wheel, we got a sine wave road. Why is it that when we went backward, starting with a sine wave road to find the wheel, we got this weird looking wheel? What's the difference? The difference turns out to be the depth of the road. That is, its vertical position beneath the intended path for the wheel's axle. It turns out the depth of the road can have a massive effect on the shape of the wheel that rolls on it, even though its overall shape is the same. When we found the sine wave road from the elliptical wheel, the sine wave we got was located at this depth. 
but the sine wave I used for the reverse problem was actually this curve. The same sine wave, but shifted down a bit. This slight change in the sine wave depth caused the winding frequency, so to speak, of the wheel's rim to fall out of sync with the radius frequency. Interestingly, if I lower the road a little bit more, the wheel closes back on itself again, resulting in a normal closed curve wheel for this sine wave road that isn't an ellipse. It turns out there are infinitely many alternatives like this. You just have to make sure you lower the road by just the right amount to ensure the resulting angle period of the wheel is an integer fraction of 2 pi. So although not every periodic road gives rise to a closed curve wheel, it turns out that you can always correct the wheel into a closed curve just by raising or lowering the road by just the right amount. And evidently, although a sine wave is the ideal road for a focus-centered ellipse, the ellipse is not the only possible wheel that can roll on a sine wave. You only get an ellipse if the sine wave road is at exactly the correct depth. Pick a different depth, and you'll get a totally different kind of wheel. Some closed, others not. So the main takeaway from all this is when attempting to find a wheel from a road, the depth of the road matters a lot, and only certain specific depths will give rise to a wheel that is a simple closed curve. Alright, with that caveat handled, let's take a look at a completely new kind of road, a sawtooth. A road composed of a sequence of upward and downward sloping line segments. What wheel rolls on this? Similar to how we dealt with the square wheel, it's helpful to analyze a piecewise road by analyzing only one of its pieces at a time. In this case, that would be a single slanted line. To keep things simple for now, let's say the slope of this line is negative 1, and its y-intercept is also negative 1. Then this line can be described by the equation y equals negative 1 minus x. Now, to use the road wheel equations, I need parametric equations for the road. But since the equation for the line is already solved for y in terms of x, we'll just co-opt x as the parameter instead of t. If this feels weird to you, this is essentially what happens if you set x equal to t and plug that into the formula for y. This simplifies our second road wheel equation to being just the derivative of theta equal to negative 1 over y, because the derivative of x with respect to itself is just 1. Now, since we have that y equals negative 1 minus x, we can rewrite negative 1 over y as negative 1 over negative 1 minus x, or just 1 over 1 plus x, and we can similarly rewrite the first equation as r equals negative the quantity negative 1 minus x, or just 1 plus x. Chugging through the algebra and calculus to solve these equations, you'll find that the wheel for a slanted linear road is described by the polar equation r equals e to the theta, whose graph is known as a logarithmic spiral, the same kind of spiral you can find in seashells or galaxies. If you change the slope of the line, you'll get the same spiral, just twisting at a different speed. Now, you might also notice that this spiral wheel is another weird wheel that doesn't close up on itself, but that shouldn't come as a surprise since the road we derived it from was a slanted line, which isn't periodic. But, of course, the line is only meant to be a piece of the road. We get the sawtooth by cutting off the line at a certain point, and attaching reflected copies of the line segment over and over, each segment giving rise to a different spiral component of the wheel. And if the road is placed at just the right depth, the wheel will eventually close up on itself to produce this flower-shaped wheel whose pedals are made up of segments of logarithmic spirals. You can even make other variants with more or fewer pedals by raising or lowering the road. Pretty neat, don't you think? Beyond a sawtooth, there are a couple of other interesting road wheel pairs that I think are worth showcasing briefly before we end things off. First, have you heard of the cycloid curve? It's the path a point on the rim of a circle travels as the circle rolls on a flat road. It's also known as the brachistochrone curve, as it solves the famous brachistochrone problem, which we don't have time to discuss in this video. Turns out, if you flip the cycloid upside down, with its cusps touching the x-axis, and use it as a road, its corresponding wheel is the classic heart-shaped curve of math, 
a cardioid. Unfortunately, this is another road wheel pair that can't be physically realized perfectly, as the cardioid actually crashes into the cusp of the cycloid road before it can get on top of it. Still, pretty neat though. As for alternate wheels, if we lower the cycloid road a bit, the wheel turns into a clover-shaped curve. Lastly, what wheel do you suppose rolls on a parabola? Any guesses? It turns out the wheel that rolls on a parabola is another parabola. In fact, the exact same parabola. Isn't that weird? A parabolic road gives a smooth ride to itself. Though I should mention that this only works at a very specific road depth. As usual, if you change the depth of the road, the wheel shape changes dramatically. In fact, the wheel isn't even a parabola for most depths. So that's a brief-ish tour of the wonderful world of weird wheels. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Hopefully it was a smooth one. Speaking of smooth rides, do you remember how we originally defined what a smooth ride meant for a wheel? We defined it as happening whenever a wheel contained some point in its interior, the axle, which stayed confined to a horizontal line as the wheel rolled on the road. But is that the only definition that makes sense? What if instead of a wheel rolling on a road, we had a wheel rolling around another wheel? In that case, a smooth ride would probably mean the rolling wheel's axle stays confined to a circular path around the stationary wheel. We'll explore that in the final video in this series, at least for now. But before then, I challenge you to think about how you would solve this modified version of the problem. How could you repurpose the techniques and tricks we used to solve the original version of the problem to solve the circular variant? What changes would we need to make to our two observations about rolling? And how would that affect the road wheel equations? I'm genuinely curious to see what you guys come up with, so please leave a comment if you have an idea, even if it's a really incomplete one. I'd love to see it. Either way, I'll see you in the next video.